Good morning. How are you today? It's good to be here, as uh, John was mentioning. Uh, I'm the teaching pastor, or a teaching pastor, at the Promise Church, and so excited that my wife here is with me as well. We live here in Farmer's Branch, so we're really close by. We had a long commute of three minutes to get here to the to Royal Haven, but we just love this community, and we love what God is doing through you. Uh, Pastor Rick and Sister Carol, they're, they're really intentional on just loving people. Uh, so I go way back to, to hearing about I-58 and now seeing Israel and, and the team just worshiping. It really fills my heart to be here with you this morning. I also received an email from Pastor Rick, just a, a report of how they're doing in, uh, in Del Rio and just their, the things that they're doing there and how they, they've had a successful trip so far. And so for me, it's exciting just to hear more about what your church is doing day in and day out. And so uh, one of the things I'd like to share with you today is just this thought, this idea um, of depletion, depletion. I, I think God has pressed this word in my heart um, this morning of just fe this feeling, this, uh, this thought of sometimes we go through these seasons that we, it seems like we're in dry brooks. And so we'll be coming from 1 Kings chapter 17. And so as you open your Bibles, I know that many of us have been in these seasons where it seems like we're in the place where God wants us to be. We're in those moments that we've heard God's word, we've heard God's calling, and we're where God wants us to be. However, things seem also to be going wrong. I know that, uh, for instance, uh, Royal Haven today is in Del Rio, and I, and I imagine that they've met a lot of people, a lot of people who are struggling, a lot of people who are going through difficult times. And for us, it could be easy to say that these people are struggling because they're not in God's will or they're not following God's purpose. But often that's not the case. And I want to show us through the example of a man named Elijah how this prophet of God will show us that he goes through different seasons, difficult times, but yet he was where God had called him to be. Um, I want to also remind you today that in our society today, we have this idea, this notion that in order to have things, you have to work for them. You have to earn things. You have to earn what you get. And a lot of times when things aren't going right, it's your fault. It's because you're not doing things well. And so that is the premise of this sermon is that I want to I show you what God has uh, revealed through Elijah He's shown us that he has called him to different moments and different things. A lot of times when we look at the Old Testament, we, we see people like Elijah, and we almost paint this, uh, this personage, this caricature that is so beyond us, so different from us, something that happened so long ago that doesn't apply to today. And so I want to encourage you this morning that as we read this story, uh, this isn't just a character that is written in Scripture to entertain us. It's not just a character that is written there for us to just get an object lesson or a moral lesson, but it's somebody that God had in Scripture, somebody who historically lived so that we could learn through his example. And I want to show you in James chapter 5 really quickly how even James talks about Elijah as a person just like you and me. It's somebody who did miraculous things. He did some amazing things, but yet here in James we see that he was just like us. And so we'll see in James 13, uh, and I believe it's up here on the, on the PowerPoint. James 5, 13. This is what it says. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil uh, in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Here is the testimony of Elijah. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. So all these things that we just read, James here is trying to show us that he was just a human like you and me. Yes, he did amazing things, but yet he was a human like you and me. For instance, he says, if you have trouble, what do we do as human beings? We pray. If we're happy, what do we do? We sing songs. 
And here he's humanizing Elijah to show us that God did amazing things through him, but yet he's just like us. And so here's what Elijah did in verse 17 is what we see. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So this is the passage, the context of what we will be seeing in, in 1 Kings 17. Elijah praying that the rain would stop, and then God fulfilling that miracle. I want us to go to the, the next slide, and we see that Elijah was a prophet that was called by God, but even in these moments, God was going to take him to different, different positions in his life. Number one, he was going to take him to a drying brook. Secondly, he was going to take him to a widow with a depleting jar. And third, he was going to take him to a widow with a, with a dying boy. Amen. And you might think, all right, okay, so this prophet Elijah was somebody who was called. He was somebody who was sent. But here we see a pattern, right? What's the pattern? The pattern is that everything Elijah goes to begins to die. It begins to deplete. Now our question is, was he supposed to be there? Was he supposed to be there? Yes, God had called him to those moments. He had called him to those things, and yet there was depletion in his life. We look at this drying brook really quickly. The drying brook was caused because there wasn't enough rain. There wasn't enough, um, uh, there wasn't enough rain that was coming down, and so famine was prevalent throughout the land. People were looking at death in the eye. They were starving, but the drought was caused by the disobedience of Israel. Amen. Here we see uh, this moment where, um, in this moment we see that Elijah, a prophet of God, is someone who was called to obey God no matter where God sent him, but yet in these moments, there were moments of depletion. And I want to ask you today as, uh, as I go in the sermon, what are those moments for you? What, what are those moments of depletion in your life? As you walked in through these doors, um, how did you feel as you walked in? Maybe uh, in this church you felt, all right, well, we're doing everything right. We're, we're listening to God's call. We're putting the right people, the right leaders in place. But yet, uh, why, what is it about us? What, why aren't we at the next level? Or why aren't we where we think we should be? But yet, God calls us, and a lot of times it won't look like a bountiful uh, amount. A lot of times God calls us to be faithful, even in those moments where things are depleting, where things are running out. Just like Elijah, he had called him to this drying brook. He had called him to a widow with the depleting jar, and he had called him to a widow with a dying boy. But yet, he was where God needed him to be. So I want to remind us today, are we where God needs us to be? And if the answer is yes, a lot of times it could mean that things will be successful, things will flourish, but sometimes that's not the case. So I want to remind you, um, as we go into 1 Kings chapter 17, I want to give you a little bit of context of, of what's going on before we really dive into the passage. Israel has had a history of disobedience, and every time they disobey, uh, Israel is faced with the consequence uh, Israel is faced with a jealous God. Why is, why is God jealous? A lot of times we wonder, why is God jealous? And we just see that time and time again, Israel is uh, going after other gods, going after other things that really aren't what God has, has purposed them for. Um, here I, in this slide, I'll, I'll show you the, the history of Israel. Israel um, was once a united kingdom. And in this united kingdom, uh, they spent 100 years in this united kingdom. Number one is uh, they had a king named Saul. You guys remember king, king Saul? Next, they had King David. And thirdly, they had King Solomon. This was when Israel was in a united kingdom. However, Solomon had a problem. Solomon had many wives. And the many wives that Solomon had um, led him to follow different idols, different lords. Each wife brought a different idol. Each wife brought a different Lord. Uh, and so the people of Israel slowly but surely started following other gods. And so here what we see is that slowly but surely the kingdom of God faced the consequence. The consequence was that God had prophesied through uh, his prophets um, that the kingdom would once split. 
they would split. However, out of the love of God for David, he waited until the death of Solomon. And so eventually we see that the kingdom divides, and then we see a series of different kings that are just evil in the sight of the Lord. Each one is more and more evil than the next. If you look at 1 Kings chapter 16, we'll be in 1 Kings 17, but if we go a step further to Kings chapter 16, we'll see a list of kings of, of the kingdom of the north, a split kingdom. And in this kingdom, we'll see kings like in 16 verse 25, we see a king named King Amri, and we see just a repetition, a list going and going and going, a repetition. Each king, it was a cycle of kings that did evil in the sight of the Lord. And each one did more and more evil before him. King Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord. And now we arrive here to the narrative of our, of our passage today. In verse six, 16, chapter 16, verse 30, King Ahab married a woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel brought with her these, these idols, these idols named Baal. And Bel was an idol, he was a god of fertility, he was a god of rain. And so here God is going to speak to the people of God against this idol, Bel. Um, I want us to read this passage real quick. Chapter, uh, 1 Kings 17. Uh, we'll read seven verses, um, and if you can follow with me really quickly. Verse 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, as the, Lord, uh, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain for the next few years at my word. Then the Lord told Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Keith Ravine, east of the Jordan. Verse 4, you will drink from the brook, and I have directed, um, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So, here, so he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the, uh, uh, the ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Amen. Let us pray really quickly for the word of the Lord. <clears throat> God, I, I thank you today for this, this morning. I thank you today for this opportunity just to open up your scripture, Father. I pray that you be with us this morning. I pray that you speak. I pray that you give us clarity of what it is you want for us to learn this morning. Uh, I thank you for um, just Elijah and this, um, this example, Father, of how to trust you even when things are depleting. And all this I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so what we've read is um, the historical context that I've given you is a, a list of, again, the United Kingdom, Dave, uh, Saul, David, and then Solomon. Solomon sinned. He followed other gods, and then the kingdom split into two, the north and the south. And so in the north, we see this list of kings that are just doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And now we arrive at this king named Ahab. And out of nowhere, God calls this prophet named Elijah. And so Elijah is this man that will do great miracles. But here we really have no context of who he is. We have no lineage. I know that you've, you've learned of the minor prophets. And the minor prophets each have their list of different things, where they're from, what city they're serving. But Elijah just randomly appears. He's this prophet that God has called to speak to his people in a time of need. And the call for Elijah was... To go to King Ahab, and he was going to tell him that for the next three and a half years, no rain would come down and no dew would show in the mornings. Okay, so he's calling him to face an evil king, and he's giving him simply that piece of information. We'll see that throughout this narrative, God is revealing to him piece by piece. He will never give him the entire map from the start. I think that's so interesting, right? As we see this passage, we see that a lot of times for us, what we want is the entire map. But God wants something from us. He wants us to learn something. The way Elijah had to learn. Imagine going up to the king with this plan, with this, with this message. There is not going to be any rain. 
We are, God is opposing this reign of fertility, this, this God of fertility, Baal, a, a God of storm, a God of rain. And now he's saying there is not going to be any rain anymore. Imagine just having that, that message for a king and not having the next piece. Okay, God, I'm before this king who could potentially kill me. What do I do next? God had not revealed it to him yet. We see that God will slowly reveal it to him. What was the next thing he told them to do? He tells them then to go to this, uh, to this, uh, here, sorry. He tells them to go to a brook, verse 4, as he has directed him. And the ravens are going to supply food for him there, right? Okay, so this is the next piece of the puzzle. God is taking him to a brook. Number one, this brook is drying up. Secondly, who's going to feed him? The ravens, the birds from the sky. What are they going to do? They're going to bring him food. They're going to bring him meat and bread. It's kind of gross, right, if you think about it. A bird bringing you food, bringing you bread, and you're supposed to eat it? Okay, God, you've called me to go to this king who could potentially kill me. You've called me to be faithful and go to him and give him a message he doesn't want to hear, but you haven't given me the next piece. And then the next piece arrives, and it's you're going to go to isolation. You're going to go off by yourself to this brook that is drying up. Why is it drying up? The brook is drying up because he himself, Elijah, has prayed for the rain to stop. Okay, God, you called me to be faithful. You called me to pray so that the rain would stop coming down. But now I'm faced with this survival piece now. Where am I going to get water from? You're taking me to this brook, but it's not going to rain for three and a half years. Slowly but surely, this water at some point is going to run out, right? God, why are you taking me to this place of depletion? Why are you taking me to this place where I don't even raise my own food? Birds have to bring food for me. Not only that, this bird, this raven is an unclean animal. So, God, you're, you're telling me to go against everything I believe in. You're telling me to go against every thought, every notion that I've ever had. What you've taught me to do, you, you're taking me away from those things that I, I know. I think it's interesting because here Elijah has to go into the unknown. And for us, the unknown is something that we fear so much. I think most of our anxieties in today's day come from the unknown. From, from not knowing what's next. But here God reveals to Elijah piece by piece. It's never the full roadmap. I think if God gave me the full roadmap, I would find a way to cut corners or I would find a way to find the, 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 the shortest path. I know that all of us use GPS right now, uh, today and age. And that GPS is always telling us to go a certain way. But for me and my instinct, it's always competitive. It tells me I'm going to get there in 10 minutes, but I want to get there in nine minutes just because that's who I am. And I, and I think if we had the full picture, a lot of times we would want to get there before the time is ready. God wanted Elijah to learn something in this moment, in this dry book. And I want you to kind of uh, just think in your own mind. What are those places? Again, Elijah was where God to told him to be. He wasn't off sinning. In fact, he was being a messenger for God. He was exactly where God wanted him to be. But yet, even in this moment, there was, he was lacking. He needed, and he was struggling for survival. But yet, he had to rely on the Lord. The Bible says in James that for three and a half years, it did not rain. So you would have to imagine that that Elijah would have to get up time and time again and go to this brook and look at the brook. If you just, in your mind's eye, just picture this really quickly, going to this brook uh, the, first, the first day, and just you can hear the sounds, right? This rushing water that is, there's so much water still left from all the rain. You go six months in, it becomes quieter and quieter. You go a year into it, and the sound that you once heard of this rushing water now is a simple stream. Imagine going three and a half years and then just looking at this puddle of water that is, is left there. What goes through your mind? 
what goes through your mind. And, and I think maybe um, uh, just in your, own, uh, in your own life, imagine uh, or just think of the place that God has called you to be in. And, and maybe um, it, it, it's, a, it's a job. Maybe it, it's a, a relationship that at first it seemed bountiful, but now it's depleting, right? And there's less and less of it. And the more you think of it, you know, the, the more you struggle to get up the next day. Just like Elijah, he had to have faith and get up and get up and get up. But it doesn't end there for Elijah. Elijah was told to move now to the next place. Where was he going to go? Where was he going to go? We'll, we'll read from verse 8. If you can follow me, uh, 1 Kings 17, verse 8. We will see that God has called them to get up and go on to the next place. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Seraphath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a, one, a, a widow to supply you with food. So he went to Ser, uh, Seraphath, and when he went there to the town gate, a widow was gathering sticks. And he called her and he asked her, Would you bring me a little water? Uh, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? And so she went, um, and as she was going to get it, he called her and bring me, please, a, pre a piece of bread as well. Okay, so we're seeing that God has called him now that, to, to leave that brook and go into another place. Where was he going to go? He was going to go to a widow who was lacking. Can you imagine this next, this next calling from God? This next place you're going to be is not going to be a drying brook. It's going to go, you're going to go and you're going to find a widow. Now, if I'm Elijah, I'm looking for the wealthiest widow in the entire town. I'm looking for somebody who has plentiful. I might go to the, 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 the main city hall and try to find somebody who looks like they have their act together. But yet God leads him to this woman who is at the town gate gathering sticks. We'll see what she's doing in verse 11, uh, verse 12. We see that this woman is gathering sticks, and there's a reason for it. She's gathering sticks because she's going to prepare her last meal, not just for her, but for her son. You kind of see, again, another picture. Okay, God, you've taken me from the palace. You've given me the next piece. I've been eating from birds for the last three and a half years. And now you've brought me here to this woman who doesn't have enough even for herself. And you're going to ask me to ask her to give me something to eat. Right? Give me bread and give me water. A lot of the ladies in church today are saying, well, that's a typical male, right? Asking for food and asking for things, right? But here Elijah has, ha has to have the audacity to ask this question, right? He has to have the audacity to ask this question because that is where God led him to. Again, a lot of times in our lives, God is going to lead us. And it doesn't mean that, it, that because there isn't enough that God hasn't called us to be there. Because we're struggling, it doesn't mean that God hasn't called us to be there. I remember, at least in my own experience... I pastored a church in downtown Dallas, uh, outdoors with the homeless. And so I, I know my brother Neil was reminding me of, of that this morning. Um, and, and I remember that when we started, we really had nothing. It wasn't anything that, that we had. I mean, I was 21 years old. I mean, that, that, that is something where I barely had enough for me to pay rent. But God had called me to go out there, and he had called me to go minister to these people out on the street who had less than I did. And I remember time and time again when we were out there, we would uh, bring food, and sometimes uh, churches would come and, and help us and supply, you know, the food that we needed. But then there were Sundays that would, I would get a call, and these Sundays, I, the, the, the call would be, hey, Pastor David, uh, we're not going to be able to come out there anymore. Um, we, we're doing a new ministry, our, our, our ministry is growing in a different way. Um, but, but yet, even in those moments, whenever I thought, okay, well, this church has brought us food, they've brought us volunteers, they've brought us different things, but now we have to continue to trust in the Lord that he will continue to provide. Amen. Even in those moments, we see that God provides. 
often the, 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 the journey went this way. Hey, Pastor David, we can't come anymore. I get another call that same moment. Hey, Pastor David, do you have a need for clothing? Or do you have a need for food? Uh, we have a church here that really wants to help out. And so God provided every single step of the way. But we had to be faithful even in those moments when things seemed to be depleting. But God was going to be faithful. And he was going to provide. And a lot of times, I want to show you this, that a lot of times, if it looks opposite from the way that we would do it, that's probably God, right? Because if God functions and he operates in things impossible, he operates in the ways that you and I would not have imagined. I, I, I just remember even, even the calling that God had on my life, I, I just remember that it wasn't anything like I would have imagined. I was, I'm a preacher's kid, and so anybody who's a preacher's kid here knows that a lot of times you run from that calling. That, that's something I don't want to do. And a lot of times, whenever we don't want to do it, that's where God steps in and says, go, go. A lot of times when we don't want to be in this moment anymore, that's when God says, be present. A lot of times when we want to run away, that's where God says, stay. And the inverse as well, whenever we're comfortable, that's a lot of times when, we, when God says, get up, arise, and go. I think when we, if we go back to this, this brook, right, where Elijah was in this moment, I think after three years, you get into a rhythm, right? Okay, well, I know what I'm going to do today. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to go get water, and a bird's going to come, and I'm going to eat whatever he brings me, right? Okay, you get used to those things. But whenever God tells you to get up and move, you're going back again into the unknown, and in this unknown, this new fear, this new anxiety comes into place. But again, God is going to supply in different ways. But we have to continue to trust him. Every time God calls us to arise and move, it's a calling for us to move away from what's comfortable and to move and to learn about his provision. See, I think if there aren't enough disruptions in our life, are, are we really growing? If we're comfortable, right, like you, you look at a, a, like a, my niece and nephew and uh, my nieces are visiting today uh, and they're, they're visiting from Germany. And so they're here for us w during the summer. And every year we see them move from different grade to different grade, right? It's not, it's unusual for a kid to remain in the same grade over and over and over and over again. It's not ideal. It's not what we want. We want them to move, right? And parents, if you're a, a parent here with, with kids at home, you want them to mature and you want them to go off and do their own life. But imagine if a child remained in the same grade over and over and over again. We would think that there's something deficient or something wrong in that space, right? But God has called us to move sometimes. And in these moves, in these transitions, where God is going to give us new provision, he's going to show us and reveal something new about him. Amen? Now, the question for us to reflect in, in a practical sense, where is God leading us to uh, individually, but also collectively? Where is God leading us to? God has provided for many years, uh, metaphorically, three and a half. But now we're in this new space, and God is going to lead us. And sometimes we think, oh, well, are they, is that new space going to have enough for us? Is that widow going to be able to provide? But even so, if God has called us, just like Elijah, we must go. Amen? We'll continue in verse 12. And, and, and uh, we see that the calling of Elijah to this woman was, Bring me, please, a piece of bread. And as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't, have any, I, don't have, uh, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. Verse 14. For this is what the Lord, the, this, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run out until the day the Lord sends rain again on the land. Amen. 
So what's happening here now is that we see that Elijah went from a moment of having to take from this woman to now being able to provide. Amen? Sometimes when we go into these moments, we see that um, we are going to be dependent on God, and God is going to use people, but also it's going to be an opportunity for us to supply needs and to, to give to other people, just as Elijah was giving to this woman. Amen? We see also the, the name of the town that they're in, Seraphath. Seraphath. I think each of these names have a meaning. We look at the name of the brook, and the name of the brook means cut off. It means uh, a place where you're removed. And so we, we look at this experience that Elijah has, and here, whenever he was cut off in isolation, a lot of times we might, we might assume that isolation it, it is a punishment, right? The fact that Elijah is isolated in the wilderness, he had obeyed God, and God had told him to go off and hide and into isolation. But the reality is that it wasn't a punishment, this isolation was not a punishment. It was for protection. God wanted to protect Elijah. And now we look here at the second place where he's at, Seraphath, and we see that this place is called refining. It's called this, this smelting. Um, the, the translation is being forged or being smelted or being refined. And so here, even in this moment, we see that he's taking him from a place of isolation to protect him, and now he's taking him to a place of refinement. Amen? Again, again, God is going to call him once again to go off into the next space. The next space is uh, what takes place now is that this woman who had supplied the need, now Elijah had supplied for her, but this woman had a son. And this son, uh, verse 17, we see, uh, and I'll read it really quickly. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill, and he grew worse and worse, and finally he stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, men of God? You come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Verse 19, give me your sign, Eli Elijah replied. He took him from her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and he laid him in his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought this tragedy even on this widow because I am staying by causing her, her son to die? Then he stretched him out on the boy. Then he stretched out himself on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. Okay, so what we're seeing here is, again, another moment of depletion. Okay, things seem to be going, uh, be going well. And as we sang today, this morning, uh, that even in those moments of, of night, even in those moments of darkness, God is still there. God is still faithful. And we see God taking Elijah in this journey, right, where things seem to be getting better, and they seem to be getting better, and slowly they keep coming back down time and time again. Now, the woman who has provided for him has lost her son. And she's beginning to think, is it because of me? Is it because of my sin? Oh, prophet of God, why have you even come here, right? She's forgotten the faithfulness that she once was given by God, right? She's forgotten that God had supplied for her once. And Elijah now has this opportunity. He enters the space of depletion, but even in this space of depletion, he has an opportunity to reveal the glory of God. Amen? In our lives, once again, in moments of depletion, we will have this opportunity to, re to reveal the glory of God. And it may not look like a resurrection as we see here in this passage. It may not look like something out of this world or, or extraordinary, but even in the daily rhythms, amen, we have this opportunity to reveal the glory of God. We see now in verse 20, uh, 20, uh, the 22nd verse, the Lord heard from Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned unto him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know, now I know that you are the man of God, and that the word of the Lord is from your mouth, and that it is true. 
Amen. So here we see a woman who had provided for him, and now he has this opportunity to reveal the glory of God to her. Amen. Okay, so I, I want to remind you once again, what are the lessons we can take from depletion? What are the lessons that you can take from your position or your situation today? What are the lessons that we can take as a church today? Perhaps we feel that we're in this position of depletion. Oh, well, God, where are you going to provide next? God, what's the next step? I, I want to know the entire thing. But I want to remind us that even when it seems like God is shutting things down, it, it, it is not that way. If God has called you to a place, if he has called you to a moment, he is good and able to provide for us. We see in Ephesians that, that it says that he is able to finish what he started. Amen? He is able to finish what he started. Many years ago here, um, God put it in, in, in the heart of someone to start uh, Royal Haven Baptist Church, right? And is God faithful to finish what he started? Is, is he able to finish what he started? Will we know the end? Maybe not. Will God reveal it to us? Maybe, piece by piece. But what has he revealed to us today? What, what are those things that he's shown us and he said, be faithful here in this moment? What are those spaces that he's told you? And, and he's, what are the opportunities that he's given you to reveal his glory in these moments? Now in your personal life, what are those things? What, what are those times that you've gone to this brook and just looked at this depleting brook day in and day out? What are those times that you've thought, well, I, I don't know what's next? I don't know what I'm going to do. I want to encourage you today to, to go to God, to go to God and say, God, I, I know that you are able. I know that you will provide. It may not look like a conventional way, the way I want it to. And a lot of times in, in my ministry, in my journey, I've, I've, I've learned to pray that way. Um, I remember, um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, um, God has given us different opportunities to, to grow in, in, new, in, in new ways, uh, to have new faith. But I remember in, in the calling that God had upon my life, I, I remember being 21 years old. I remember wanting to run from the calling, my dad being a pastor and me not wanting to do the same things that he had, he had done. I knew how difficult the pastorate could be. I knew how difficult it is to, you know, to, to carry your own weight and then to, to help others and shepherd others. And I was running from that calling. But I prayed, God, I, just reveal to me in a way that I wouldn't imagine. <laughs> reveal to me what it is you want from my life. Make it so that I can't fabricate it. And, and, and he did that. He, he did that in my experience. And I, again, I'm Baptist, so I, so I don't know what that means to you. But I, I, it means to me that Sometimes I just want to stay as conventional as it, as it can be, straight to the word. I don't want anything out of the ordinary. But God called me, right, to, to pray that way. He put that in my heart to pray that way, and he revealed it to me in that way. I want to ask you today to, to pray for those, for those things. God, reveal to me. Show me clearly that it's you. I don't want it to be me. Are we ready for God? Just the way, the way Elijah did it. The way he prayed, the, the way he answered the calling, the way he got up and the way he moved from position of provision to the next. Are we ready to get up and go? Amen. I'm going to ask uh, Heritage to, to come up here, uh, our Heritage group. And I want us to, as they're coming up, I, I want us to pray for, um, I want to pray for you personally. But also I want to pray for Royal Haven Baptist Church. For us to, to know where God is leading us. For us to um, be, be, be confident, even in this dry brook. God, I, I want, I'm asking you, God, to show us. Reveal yourself, Father, in ways that we wouldn't have imagined. We thank you that you have been faithful up until now in our lives individually. But God, we thank you that you've also been faithful here at Royal Haven. 
I thank you that you've taken us from, from victory to victory. And, and I know that you're preparing us, Father, every step of the way. I pray for my brothers and sisters here, Father, that as we move from, from place of depletion from time to time, that you might reveal to us a, a new faith. I pray that in these moments where you give us an opportunity to reveal your glory, that we might be able to answer that call. I pray for if there's anyone here struggling in maybe their, their finances or in their marriage, or maybe even in their faith, Father, that they've arrived to the point where it just, they just don't know where the next portion is going to come from. I pray just as Ephesians say that, that you are faithful, that you are able to finish what you started. And I pray that you finish what you started in their lives. I pray that as they journey through this process of sanctification, Father, that you be there every single step of the way. Father, I thank you for the example of Elijah. I thank you that he wasn't there just simply for our entertainment or just for a historical record, Father, but he is there to show us and reveal to us how you've acted upon his life and you can act upon our own lives as well. I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters here today. I pray that you continue to bless them. I pray that you continue to use them as you have until today. Now let's pray in your name. Amen.